what I'm going to talk about today is censorship and collection development. Intellectual freedom, I know you guys have had a lot of this stuff beaten down your throats since you started here, but I want to talk about intellectual freedom and, the, and censorship in the context of collection development. So, the right of every individual to both seek and receive information from all points of view without restriction. That's what ALA defines intellectual freedom as. You know, we know ba the basic tenets of this. This is the actual verbiage that they use. But the idea is that we provide free access to all expressions of ideas through which any and all sides of a question may be explored. With regard to censorship, they define it as a change in the access status of material based on the content of the work and made by a governing authority or its representatives. What does that mean? The change in the stat, how, how can censorship be the change in the status of a material? Don't we somehow change the access? You get a cage down in Lockwood. Not because we, we don't have it there to censor material, we have it there to protect material, to keep it from being sliced, pages sliced out of a book, or to keep it from being stolen. Because censors can work in very unique and creative ways. They might not be able to get you to actually remove material from your library, but they can charge it out indefinitely. And while they have it charged out, they can blacken out things they find should not be there. They can razor out pages. They can lose it. Um, they can have all their friends come and charge it out all the time so that it's never there. So there are ways, but what does that do? It changes the access status, because if it's never on the shelf, who's going to find it? You can misshelve it. You know, if it's a quest questionable material, you can just continually go in there and grab it and put it someplace else or dump it behind the shelf. So it changes the access status. And that status can be from reduced access to no access at all. Okay, so that's, I mean, when you think of censorship in those terms, there's a lot that can fall under that. Changing access status is something that we as selectors do. By not providing access, by selecting or not selecting material, aren't we, under this definition, also censors? Of course, we have much better reasons for doing it, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But if we look at strictly this definition, we are all censors. If you get a chance, I'm not going to go over all of this, but I've, I've underlined in these propositions of the Freedom to Read statement the things that, I've, that you know, to me stand out. Let me read this first one. It is in the public interest for publishers and librarians to make available the widest diversity of views and expressions, including those that are unorthodox, unpopular, or considered dangerous by the majority. Now, can you think of an example? of something that you might find in a library that would be considered unorthodox, unpopular, or considered dangerous by the majority. How about um, if you put yourself back in the 30s, Mein Kampf, and yet if people had actually read that instead of banning it, they would have known what Hitler was going to do. He outlined it all there. So what they're talking about here is public interest for publishers and librarians. So we think immediately of books. What other things can be censored that we would deal with in our field? The internet. Anybody work in a library where you have filters? SEPA requires filters on computers in libraries that receive federal funding. That's a, a form of censorship, isn't it? Does freedom, re freedom to read extend beyond just a physical formatted item? When we select, we can control some of this stuff. For instance, we may be able to keep materials that would fall under hate speech out of our libraries. But what about stuff that people can access on the internet for free? You know, does a person have a right to come in and use your computer and look at a website for the Aryan Nation or the neo-Nazis? Yeah, they do. Does a person have the right to come into a public library and look at a pornographic site? Yeah, they do. Again, as we, as we go further into this, I'll, I'll, I'll get into what is so difficult about talking about censorship and how we are supposed to be the people who prevent censorship and, and we are the defenders of academic freedom and the defenders of intellectual freedom and how idealistic that is when you compare it to the practical aspects of actually running a library or information agency. It's not that easy. Publishers, librarians, and booksellers do not need to endorse every idea or presentation that they make available. 
So we're not supposed to choose one side or the other, but try to provide all sides of a story, all sides of an issue. Um, this, is, this is also where it gets very dicey. It is contrary to the public interest for publishers or librarians to bar access to writings on the basis of personal history or political affiliations of the author. Now, this is the thing that I personally would find very difficult to do. Because there's stuff that I don't want to really see in a library because it's junk, or I feel it's junk. But it may still be extremely popular, and it may still be stuff that my patrons want. And you'll all run into this. Why do I have to spend good money on this? I won't go into it anymore because I'll reveal my political biases, most of which you guys already know. But someone who is at the opposite end of the spectrum would feel the same about material that I might think would be appropriate for a library. And just as I would expect them to have the material that I agree with in the library, it's up to me to also provide material that I don't necessarily agree with, but serves someone's needs. This is what's tough. If our patrons want it, we have, we have that, that obligation. This is why we outline all this stuff in our collection development policies, because those policies provide guides so that when we do have to not select material for whatever reason, we have something to back us up. So as selectors, we want to try to provide access to everything possible, right? But we're also doing this with the assumption that people can figure out what's true and what's not true, isn't it? At what point do we have to determine that? We're never going to have enough staff where we can evaluate everything critically. So what we do is we're trying to teach people, our patrons, the general public, to evaluate that information. But the majority of, of our patrons don't know how to do that. They think it's on the internet, oh, it must be true. Because information is so pervasive now, because we get bombarded with information in so many different formats, this is why information literacy and, and what we refer to as multimodal literacies have become so important. Being a selector, I mean, you found it challenging just to purchase just a limited number of books. Imagine having to do that for a whole library. Uh, and imagine being held responsible for the content of the material that's in those books. And you haven't even read those materials. There's no place in our society for efforts to coerce the taste of others, confine adults, notice they say adults, to reading matter deemed suitable for adolescents. What does that mean? We don't want to confine adults. That is, if an adult wants to read a Harlequin, they should be able to. If they want to read a book that has anatomically correct photographs in it about reproduction, they should not be forced to read materials that are designed for a seventh grader. This is, this is a way of, of basically, this is a very diplomatic way of saying, if you want to read slutty, smutty stuff, then you should have the right to do it. You shouldn't have to read slutty, smutty stuff designed for five-year-olds, which isn't slutty or smutty at all. But I love the, the, you know, the diplomatic way this is stated. Oh, okay, it's not in the public interest to force a reader to accept the prejudgment of a label. It's the responsibility of publishers and librarians. Guardians of the people's freedom to read to contest encroachments upon that freedom by individuals or groups seeking to impose their own standards. So that's where we get that label as the radical militant librarians who protests the invasion of privacy, who protests filtering computers. Give full meaning to the freedom to read by providing books that enrich the quality and diversity of thought and expression. Now this seems, seems like a good thing, right? You want diversity of thought and expression. And most people will say, that's a great thing to have until somebody's expression of thought is against their own. So, how do we implement these tenets? And if you haven't read the um, Freedom to Read statements in full, you should, because you'll find what I did when I first looked at them eons ago, back when I was in library school, that they sound great and they seem really, really useful. But when it comes to practical implementation of them, they're sufficiently vague in that they don't provide us with a lot of practical guidelines to do our jobs. 
And they're certainly not very helpful in fighting off an angry parent who wonders why you have this disgusting book in your collection. So when we look at censorship, we need to look at it from two lenses. Uh, there's organizational censure, censorship, and then there's individual censorship. And so if we can learn how to separate the two, it helps a lot when we're, when we're developing policies that involve censorship and how to combat censorship. Or perhaps you're in an institution that wants to censor certain materials. You could be in a library that is in an institution that is trying to promote one particular way of thinking. So you have to, I mean, you have to fall within the mission goals and objectives of your, of your institution. So let's look at this organizational censorship. We can look at it from the context of laws and regulations, library policies and actions, pressure from organized groups. Then we have an individual perspective. That's individual users who come in and complain about a book or material or the fact that your internet access is not filtered or the, pa the fact that your internet access is filtered. And then we librarians ourselves. Self-censorship is, is far more common than you might think, because the last thing we ever want to do is think of ourselves as censors. But just going through day-to-day -day selection, we are. Really, the, the idea of a balanced collection is a relatively new idea. We were the ultimate censors at the beginnings of public libraries and in the early 1900s when, AL, when, when librarianship became a profession when he was being inaugurated as president of ALA. Arthur Boswick talked about the librarian's role as a censor. You know, he bragged about it. He said, it's our duty to censor material. It's our duty to keep, essentially, crap out of the library. And at this time, we also tried to keep certain types of people out of the library. We felt that we had an obligation to make sure that the library had materials that would help people to become educated, that were intellectual in nature. The worst thing in the world was to have to subscribe to a newspaper or Harper's Weekly or any of those popular magazines. So we were, we were, we were censors and we were proud of it. It's not until the 70s that this idea of free access uh, to these kinds of materials became what we do. I suppose it's a period when we became more en enlightened as a profession. Not sure what really instigated that, but we took on this, this new role of being the people who fought censorship and tr tr tried to provide access to information regardless of who you were or what you wanted to use that information for. So we talk about our balanced collections and, and representing all the views of a pluralistic society. How realistic is this? as realistic as our budget, and re as realistic as the pluralism of our society. Can we be everything to everyone? No. If we had unlimited funding, we could. If we had unlimited space, we could. But even with unlimited funding and unlimited space, we would still have people who complain about what we have in our libraries. So it's all great talk. It's a, it's a wonderful philosophy to have, and we try to stick within those guidelines that ALA provides, or the guidelines we set up at our own institutions. But when it comes to practical implementation of this, it's not realistic. We have budgetary constraints, space constraint, constraints, user needs in the mission of your institution. If the mission of your institution does not involve providing for a pluralistic society, then you're not going to, right? Information and misinformation. Why do we turn to selection aids? Because we need expert opinions on materials that maybe we don't know everything about. We want to try to avoid having misinformation. What about this whole idea of having a balanced collection, a rounded collection? See, it's, it's tough, tough to be in our shoes. And I mentioned, I've mentioned this already. I think I've mentioned this a couple times throughout the course. So let's look at the frame of reference with which we can look at censorship versus selection. Now you'll notice up here, selectors are good, censors are bad, because it's all in how we frame it. But a selector is, in essence, a censor. But a selector is positive, looking for reasons to acquire material, whereas a censor is negative, looking for reasons to 
reject material. Our justifications are driven by internal factors, our collection development policy, our knowledge of our users' needs. That's a good thing. A sensor, on the other hand, justifications are external to the library. Again, sensors are bad. Selectors are good. Selectors use professional judgment. See, this is why you come to library school, so you can be brainwashed by people like me. Sensors, on the other hand, use value judgments. Now, does that mean a selector never uses a value judgment? I'll bet you you will if you have a request from a patron to buy material on Holocaust denial. The kinds of things that usually involve censorship, they tend to be religious in nature, and they usually have to do with our values. And those are the hardest things to negotiate. Those are the hardest things to find common ground on. You get somebody who is pro-life fighting against someone who is pro-choice. <laughs> There's no common ground there. So if you're a person who falls on either end of that spectrum, how do you balance your personal values with your professional obligations? Because you're going to run into this. You know, you turn to the policy as a guide when you find it difficult to make that kind of judgment. And don't ever feel that you have to compromise your personal values when you are in a position of selecting. If you feel strongly enough about an issue, and you know that you have to select something for your library that is against your value judgment, simply ask a colleague to do it for you. Often your colleagues will understand, there will be some who won't. You know, how can you not put aside your personal beliefs and do what is professionally right? Well, hey, you got to live with yourself. I mean, I'm, I'm probably breaking every rule in the ALA handbook, but I'm also a pragmatist. And if you can't live with yourself, ask a colleague to help you out. In more, many more instances than you might think, they would understand and would be willing to do that. Does that surprise you that I would say something like that? Because you know I'm brainwashing all of you. I mean, I've been a librarian for a long time. And there's been a lot of stuff that's crossed my desk that I've wondered, why, why have we spent money on this? You know, you have to, you're a human being first and a librarian second. And you're a person who lives in a pluralistic society, but you're still an individual. So I hope that people have the ability to, to kind of separate themselves. It's, when it comes to professional ideals versus value judgment, it's a really, really tough call. This is soul searching that you guys all have to do as individuals. I can't give you a right or wrong answer on that, and no one should give you a right or wrong answer on it. What you have to do is weigh the, I don't want to say consequences, the results, though, of, of your decision. For instance, if I'll go back to this pro-life, pro-choice thing. If you have to buy material that is pro-choice, can you, in your own mind, balance it with material that is pro-life? You know, perhaps you can, you can work that and, and provide for a rounded collection. Again, when it comes to value judgments, it's really hard. And I don't know the answer to that, but it's something that, that I think many of you will face at some points in your career. I'm just trying to get the point across that, that, you know, it's great to have these philosophies and it's great to, to profess these kinds of ideas. But sometimes, you know, when you live in a pluralistic society, and we're all individuals, and we all have individual beliefs and, and values and stuff, you know, you're going to run into these kinds of conflicts. So back to the good selectors, bad censors. Selectors aim to provide access, and censors aim to prevent access. When the selector does not choose an item, it may have to do with factors external to the item. No money, no space, not part of the collection development criteria. But censors reject solely because of content. So it's all in how you spin it. So what to do before a censor arrives? You will have to deal with censors. You will have to deal with challenges, regardless of the type of library that you are in. Even in corporate libraries, you're going to have some CEO or board member who come in and might say, why are you providing access to this kind of material? It's not so much in corporate libraries because you have very strict guidelines in your collection development policy. There's not much room for interpretation on your part. You are there to provide for the needs of the employees, and those are usually very, very strict and very specific. Uh, but every once in a while, 
you'll have to deal with someone who has a problem with something that you have in your collection. So you want to prepare a policy statement and procedures on how to handle this. And you want to have this policy approved by whoever your authoritative body is. And if you're a public library, this means your director, your board of trustees, and whoever is in charge of your funding. If you're in an academic library, it'll be your director, it'll be whatever entity at the, at the university or college level that you answer to. In a school library, of course, it'll be the, the principal and the probably the, the um, school board as well. But that authoritative approval is what gives the policy its, its strength. Because it's not your policy, it's the institution's policy. You want to make sure every single staff member understands how to handle a censor or somebody who is challenging material. Everyone from the director to the reference librarian to the clerk who sits at the circulation desk. The frontline people, those are the people who are going to deal with the censors. They don't make it to the director till three quarters of the way through the process. But that poor circulation clerk is going to have to deal with the wrath of somebody. So make sure they understand what the policy is and that they have all of the tools available to them that they need. Where can they find it online to print out a copy for this patron? Um, do they have copies of it at the CERC desk that they can reach and hand the patron? I would recommend having copies on hand in a nice, easy to access location because if you've got somebody who's screaming and yelling at, you want to give them something to make them happy or less likely to scream and yell at you. Um, they mentioned role playing. And that's not, I mean, it seems kind of goofy, but you know, when you're dealing with the public and you're dealing with a pluralistic society, it doesn't hurt to, you know, to uh, kind of go through uh, a couple of scenarios and, and how you would handle it. Don't underestimate that complaints become, can become violent. People who challenge these kinds of material, who tend to have very, very extreme views, it's not uncommon for, for mental illness to be a part of that. Role playing is a good idea because it prepares people for the possibility that this can happen. But you're in a public library, you're going to, again, you're going to, you're going to have people who are homeless. You're going to have people who are outpatients. And, and sometimes you're just going to have a really upset parent. And they can be pretty scary sometimes too. Because if you think about it, for whatever reason, regardless of their beliefs, they think that this is material that is dangerous to their children. Sometimes the, the fear is misguided, but the fear is still there and fear makes people react in, in sometimes very, very strong ways. This is why we don't want to necessarily hate a person who has a problem with some of our material, but kind of help them through the process of challenging it. That is their right after all. Sometimes just listening will calm people down to where you can have a conversation and explain, this is the process that you go through. Let me help you with these forms. And I'll tell you exactly when you can hear from the director and, and then we'll go from there. And a lot of times when they lit, when, okay, all right, we'll do this. Keep in mind that ALA, uh, Office of Intellectual Freedom and the Freedom to Read Foundation are not regulatory bodies. And if you have a challenge and someone is going to take you to court over it, you are not going to get any financial assistance from them. They will give you advice. They might recommend an attorney but you will get nothing from them in terms of assisting you to fight a challenge. So understand that they provide guidelines, but they're not going to provide you with, with legal representation if you should happen to get sued over an item. Okay, That's why they provide guidelines that are sufficiently vague and subject to interpretation. Legal aid may in some cases be provided by the Freedom to Read Foundation, depending on how much money they have. And depending on how, how controversial your case is, collection development policy is your best defense, and the criteria for selection are the things that you can turn to to say, hey, it's not my idea. Our criteria state that we have to have this in the collection. So you can blame the institution. That's another way you can get around the values thing, too. You can say the institution states that I must do this. Sometimes it's a little easier to to pass off some of that blame or credit, depending on how you look at it. 
your criteria also supports non-selection of materials that someone might think should be in your collection. For instance, Holocaust denial materials. And how you write your policy, I mean, you'll see good examples. Things that constitute hate speech are not accepted. Things that constitute propaganda are not selected. Now, how do we define hate speech? How do we define propaganda? Sufficiently vague, open to interpretation. It's good a good idea to, to include in your policy either a printout of the Freedom to Read and, and Freedom to View guidelines, or at least, if you refer to them, provide a link. Just make sure you check those links every, like, it seems ALA changes their website every two years, so the links all go bad, so, you know, make sure you keep them updated. But it doesn't hurt to keep, to, to include them as appendices. Don't make them part of the full text. Uh, include them as additional items in your policy. And uh, policy for dealing with requests for reconsideration of materials are not required in co collection development policies, except in this class, okay? So do have one of these in your policies. I don't know if I can make it any more clear, but I don't want to take points off for you not having this, because you need to think about how you're going to word such a policy. Now, I'll let you go through this. This is policy. All of the underlines are my emphasis, not, not, not necessarily in the policy itself. But I think you'll find it interesting. And then these are, are examples of a public library and then a uh, university. They give you exam examples of the forms that they use. And that is all I have. <laughs>